So um, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to talk here. It's, it's great to be here. So um, after that astonishing talk that we just had, I am, I'm afraid, going to be very much more down to earth. Um, so this will be uh, a lot more basic and uh, a lot fewer images, many fewer images. Um, I think maybe this is unnecessary. I didn't realize there was going to be a bio in the program. I, so there's a, a brief biography. Um, I am a, this is my second career. My first career was as a mathematician, so now I'm a failed mathematician or maybe a recovering mathematician. Um, I am one of the Python core developers since about 10, 11 years ago and a, a PSF member. Um, I get obsessed, as some of you found out at lunchtime today, with floating point and numerics. So um, I'm very, very happy to talk about those things at length, but not right now. Um, and I joined Enthought about eight years ago as a scientific software developer. Um, I'm now principal architect there. And so what I wanted to do is, uh, Enthought's been around for almost 20 years now, so 17 years. Um, we've been delivering those scientific applications for, for 17 years. Uh, I've been with Enthought for, for maybe half that time. I've seen a lot of evolution, a lot of changes in the way we deliver things. And I wanted to give some insights into the software stack that lets us do what we do. Um, so the pieces of software that make it possible to deliver all these different scientific applications to, to various different com companies. Um, and so, yeah, uh, like I said, very down to earth. Um, and okay. And so uh, our work, so we're, we're, I guess we're known as a Python shop. This is SciPy. Um, our work touches a lot of different languages. And so this is a very partial list, but these are some of the languages that I've touched in the various projects that I've worked on with Enthought. Um, so not just Python, C, C++, Fortran. Uh, my first professional job was as a Fortran programmer. Um, R, little bits of C Sharp, .NET, a lot of JavaScript, so a lot of things moving into the web world. Um, MATLAB, IDL, and much, much more. Um, Python lies at the core of almost every single project that we do at Enthought. So Enthought's focus, I think uh, Eric said a lot of this already, so Enthought's focus is science, not Python, right? We, we, we're crazy about the science. We want to do amazing things with the science. So why are we choosing Python? What's going on there? Why, why choose that language? Um, so some traditional reasons there. Okay, it's useful as a glue language. I can take a Fortran library and a C++ library and write a Python script that takes some input files, sends those inputs to Fortran, Maybe the Fortran does some finite element computation. You get some results back. Send them to the C++ library, which does some signal processing. Get results back. Display those in a UI. Combine everything together. So Python's fantastic as a glue language. It's written in C. That means that it's instantly compatible with C and C++ libraries um, with a little bit more work. It makes Fortran libraries available. So it, it really does an excellent job of pulling things together. Um, it gives us rapid development and deployment. So. I'm not sure I really want to use the word agile, but we work in a fairly agile way with our customers, almost continuous delivery. We want to be making, uh, making, our, making our applications available on a weekly, if not a daily basis, um, so the customer sees updates. And requirements change all the time, and Python is part of the solution that lets us deal with changing requirements. So a new set of requirements comes in. Uh, because Python is so flexible, we can get solutions to those requirements within a much shorter time than we would if, if it was C++ or Java or, or something else. Um, it's free, of course. This is a big deal. So MATLAB is one of the big competitors here. Uh, if you try to put MATLAB on a cluster and you find yourself paying per node in that cluster, it's a big bill. So of course, Python is free, and that's a huge part of its adoption. Um, so free as in beer. You don't have to pay for it. Free as in speech, uh, a very permissive license. Um, and there's, there's something missing at the bottom here. So there's a fifth item here that I'm going to get to. But so those are some of the reasons that we choose Python. But here's the awful truth. Right. Python really is a terrible language for doing scientific development. OK, so just let that sink in for a moment. Um, 
You know, it's true. So I've been working with Python for over 20 years. Uh, I've been a core developer on the Python project for over 10 years. I've seen a lot of the nooks and crannies of Python. At Enthought, we build big applications. We discover all sorts of little details and horrible corners of Python that most people don't, don't even see. So we're responsible for a lot of bug reports in the Python bug tracker. Uh, it wasn't designed for science. It doesn't have efficient arrays. Uh, the garbage collection is all over the place. You probably want some kind of typing setup, and there's no typing. Right, so you don't have static typing. It, it really wasn't designed for this. Why would we use Python rather than something like Julia, for example? So Julia, is, is, this is a really amazing, fantastic language. It's built out of the box for this, this kind of scientific application. Um, but we're using Python. And so, OK, let me rephrase. All right, so Python by itself is a terrible language for scientific development. At Enthought, we don't build on Python. Our foundation is not Python. It's Python plus NumPy. And Python plus NumPy, that's an entirely different language from just Python. So NumPy gives you efficient array types. But then, OK, so why Python? There's that last missing piece. The scientific Python ecosystem. Right, this is what makes Python the language to go to to build these scientific applications. It's not the core language, it's, I mean, okay, so the core language is part of it, but it's, it's not the details of the core language, it's that huge ecosystem of libraries that's been built up over the last 20 years. So I'm now echoing some of Eric's, um, Eric's talk here. But, um, so the scientific Python ecosystem, and when I start to think about the scientific Python ecosystem, you know, what, what I wanted to do was go through some of this, but this would be horribly redundant. So Eric's talked about lots of the pieces of the scientific Python ecosystem. All right, we have NumPy, uh, we have SciPy, you have Matplotlib, um, right, scikit-learn, scikit-image, TensorFlow, H5Py for efficient, efficient storage to HDF5 files, all sorts of plotting libraries, libraries for talking to CPUs. So there's so much going on here. And I didn't want this talk just to become a list of libraries and what they do. No, we could go on for a long time. Um, and I was preparing these slides and thinking, I wanted to describe all these libraries, but there isn't enough time. And I wanted to just switch focus a little bit. And I, w I went back and I looked at one recent project at Enthought. This is actually an ongoing project at Enthought. It's not even a, a particularly major project. But I just took that one project from Enthought, and I look at the package list. So whenever our, one of our developers sets up that scientific environment, there's a list of packages that gets, up, gets installed. Um, Diedrich may have a little bit more to say about this later. Um, and just looking at the length of that package list, there are, so we have a lot of code, maybe 20,000 lines of our own code, but then 160 external packages used. Right, we're really building on top of this scientific ecosystem. So not just NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, Scikit-Learn, Scikit-Image, what is that, five, 10 libraries, 160 external packages. Um, we're cheating a little bit, so two of those packages are closed source and they're things we've written, but 158 of those are open source, free, available to everybody in the SciPy community. And just a, a slightly bigger breakdown. OK, so of those 158, 154 are BSD, MIT style, very open licenses, um, free to use for commercial things, for non-commercial things, exactly as you like. And then a couple, so actually four, are either GPL or LGPL. Um, and then of those 158, maybe 10 of those, OK, a little bit more cheating. So almost all those are out there in the scientific Python ecosystem. Maybe 10 of those are Enthought packages. And so we deliver these closed source applications to customers, but we also maintain a suite of open source libraries that let us do all this. Okay, so none of this is new. You're coming to SciPy Japan, you know about NumPy, SciPy, all these things that are out there. Um, okay, so this is kind of what I think of as the other thing. I, I want to describe the Enthought platform. And I think of the Enthought platform in terms of layers. So you've got Python sitting at the bottom, maybe with NumPy alongside it. You've got all that scientific Python stack, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, IPython, everything else going on top of that. And then we have our own tool stack sitting on top of that. But that's really not right. So the way it actually is, you've got Python at the bottom. You have one stack, the scientific stack, maybe on the left. And then on the right-hand side, you have it's sort of a complementary stack. It's like two legs of a table propping up this platform. Um, and this is the bit I wanted to talk about a little bit more. So, 
Uh, I think everybody, everybody here has heard of NumPy, SciPy. Um, okay. So everybody here has heard of NumPy and, and SciPy. Uh, I think maybe not everybody here has heard of the NThought tool suite. And this is the, the suite of tools we, we've developed as a result of delivering those scientific applications over a decade and a half, 17 years, more than that. So these came out of, we have a set of common needs for these applications, and slowly those common needs crystallized into concrete packages that we can reuse, um, and that let us do really rapid application development. And just going back to the left leg, yeah, okay, so this was taken from the very first slide, so we've been delivering scientific applications. So this is all about the science, to customers for 17 years. Um, same sentence, we've been delivering scientific applications to customers for 17 years. And the Enthought tool suite, it's a lot about building this application layer as well as the scientific layer. Um, so our end users are usually not developers. We don't write code for developers, we write code for uh, the people just one down the line from developers. The engineers, they've implemented some algorithm, they want to be able to visualize that algorithm in a user interface. Okay, so user interfaces, ease of use. Um, and so the Enthought tool suite comprises a set of open source libraries. It's constantly evolving uh, that we've written and maintained to make it possible to deliver, the, deliver these applications. Um, and again, I don't want this to become a big long list. So right at the heart of the Enthought tool suite, how many people have heard of traits, Enthought traits? Apart from the Enthorters, Enthorters aren't allowed to put their hands up. Everybody at Enthort has heard of Enthort traits. Enthort traits is like NumPy. So NumPy is foundational for the scientific side of the stack. Right, you can't do anything without NumPy. Almost any, any library that's doing anything numerical is going to be returning results in NumPy array format. Right, so NumPy is foundational. Traits is the foundation for our application delivery, for, our, for the Enthort tool suite. Um, and what does traits do? So for a while, when, when I joined in Thought, if you went to the traits site, so let me just bring that up. Uh, nope, wrong one. Uh, okay. So there is traits. It's open source, BSD license, like the rest of the tool stack. Um, and it has this one liner here. So traits explicitly typed attributes for Python. And this is wrong. This should be changed. So yes, one of the things traits does is it provides static typing. Uh, a little bit like Python's data classes that are, that are new in Python 3.7. But this is really not what Traits is about. Um, so here's what Traits is about. Traits is about UI-ready data models. You give a declarative description of your data model. Okay, so this is a float, this is an array, this is a string, dot, dot, dot. All at declarative level. Um, and what it lets you do is it lets you build UIs based on those models in a very short amount of time. Um, and the reason that's possible, so UIs involve a lot of interactivity, people, are, users are pushing buttons, looking at results, and so that's the second part of traits. Traits gives you event-driven programming. It implements uh, something called the observer pattern. So you make a change to a key quantity, you have listeners attached to that change, and that chain of listeners propagates all the way down, and you get results. Okay, so that's what traits really is. It's not about typing. Sure, it lets you, lets you do typing, um, give explicit types to things, static typing, but it's really about UI-ready applications and event-driven programming. Um, and then there's a suite of other tools, and so traits, UI, and PyFace. Okay, traits is just the model. Traits UI provides the UI components that sit on top of that. And you can, you can create a user interface with very, very little work. And I'm going to give you a demo um, in, a, in a short time. Um, other components here. So the other part, I, I considered giving a whole talk about Envisage. But I think it's a little bit just too focused and, and um, too niche an audience. Uh, but Envisage is really another foundational part of what we do. And what Envisage does is it lets us build pluggable applications. All right. So we deliver a lot of applications. We need to share a lot of code between those applications. We want a way to plug components into those applications with very little work. So if you have a sort of core application plus extra plugins, you can plug those plugins in um, and then plug different plugins in for different customers. Again, it's all aimed at rapid application development. 
And so right. traits is foundational for almost any UI. Envisage for big applications where you're trying to build that application out of components. It gives a framework for, for those components. Um, and then we have a, a suite of plotting libraries, two-dimensional plotting, three-dimensional plotting. And none of this is new. So traits, traits UI, these, these have been around since I joined the company, since long before I joined the company. Envisage has been around for a long time. But the Enthold tool suite is, is, it has been around for a long time. It's constantly evolving. It's constantly being maintained. There's a renewed focus recently on making sure that it's properly documented. Uh, we're growing as a company. We discovered that you really, really need documentation for all the new people coming in. So there's a lot of focus on tightening these things up, making them even more usable. And also a lot of new things coming in. And I, this is a little bit of self-indulgence because uh, so there are new ETS libraries popping up all the time. There was one new library popped up last year, um, probably more than one, but one new library got introduced last year. And this was called Traits Futures. And so I wanted to give you just a, a very brief demo of this. Again, very down to earth. Um, how many people have built uh, a user interface that sits on top of a computation for, for Python? So you have some core computation, you want a user interface that sits on top of it that makes it available to people. They press the big go button, it runs the computation. Anybody done that? Okay, so excluding Enthorders again. I, okay, so Colin's putting his hand up. Um, so this is what we do for almost every project for Enthought, right? We want to build a usable user interface. There's some core computation that's going on. Maybe it's some continuous thing. Maybe it's just a, a fire and forget style computation. Um, we build a, a beautiful user interface around that computation. Uh, it's got lots of dials and sliders to th set things up. And it's got a big green button that says go. So you set up your computation. You set up the inputs. Uh, you turn all the dials to exactly the right place. You press that calculate button. And now what happens is your application freezes. Because our UI systems are single process, single thread. Everything's happening in, a, in the single thread. And that means while, while, your, while your code is busy doing that computation, your application is frozen. You can't, you can't even resize the window. Right. And that's hopeless. And so we've solved this problem many, many, many times over the years. And the solution is very simple. You ask. Uh, anybody who has experience here, the solution is very simple. You use multi-threading or multi-processing. You put that background computation in a separate thread or a separate process. But now you open yourself up to a new world of pain because concurrency, multi-threading, multi-processing is really hard. It's hard to get right. You get crashes, you get deadlocks, so segmentation for strange results that only happen one time out of every thousand runs. You know, so everything works 999 times, then on the thousandth time it does something really bizarre just because of some, some crazy timing issue on the threads. Um, and so we solved this in an ad hoc way many, many different times. And what I wanted to do was pull that solution out and make it general, have a general solution. So idiot-proof multi-threading, idiot-proof background computations. And this was traits futures. Um, OK. And I have a few minutes left, so I'm going to uh, just give you a quick demo here. Uh, sorry, I'm struggling a bit because I was hoping to have a duplicated display, but I, I, I can't see here what's going on there. So, um, OK. So here's an example. I'm going to come back to the code and just show you some of the code. This is a, a very simple example. It's built using the Enthought tool suite. It's less than 200 lines of code. Um, OK, so it doesn't do anything revolutionary, really astonishing. I, I don't have any morphing images to show you. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to compute pi. OK, so somewhat futile, because everybody knows what pi is. Um, OK, so I do have a new slide which I snuck in, which didn't go to the translators. So I do apologize to the translators for this new slide. Um, but this is very much visual. I almost got a SciPy Japan logo in there. There just wasn't quite time to get the, the full SciPy logo on there. So almost a Japanese flag. Um, all right, you want to compute pi. We're going to compute pi in one of the stupidest, simplest ways possible. Draw a square. Draw a circle inside the square. Throw random points at the square. Count how many land in the square. Right, and then that ratio. 
So four times the number of points that land in the circle divided by the total number of points gives you an approximation to pi. Not a very good one, but an approximation to pi. This particular example, we had 256 points. It turned out 196 landed, in the, landed inside the circle. And so we get an approximation of 3.0625, which is probably not even good enough for engineering work. Um, OK, so there's, that's what we're going to do. And let me go back to the example. Can I, is this going to let me zoom in now? Yeah, it is. Excellent. OK. Um, so this is a very simple user interface. So the same sort of thing. I have a, a background calculation. I have a big go button. It isn't green, sorry. But it says approximate. Um, we're going to compute a million points at a time, throw a million points at that square and count how many land in the circle, and then another million, then another million, then another million. And we're going to keep on going. And I click on approximate, and it starts calculating. Um, but the interesting thing here is this calculation is now running in a background thread. Um, it is all interactive. 100 is the number of points that's being displayed at this point, so I can change that. I get instant feedback, so let's just show 10 points at a time, and see, you see them whizzing past, show 100 points, and you get something a little bit slower. Um, yeah, some details here. The red line is the pi approximation. The green line is because we secretly know what pi is. And then the gray lines are a confidence interval, just to make it nicer. So we've got a 95% confidence interval on our approximation. Um, OK. And I can cancel easily. Um, and so, right, it's not that impressive. It's a small demo. Where this, the, the selling point here is the code. Uh, whoops, not that one. I want that one. OK. And so this code is on the Traits Futures GitHub website. Again, it's open source. This is one of the examples, so you, you can find this. But in just less than 200 lines, you can create an example like that. And for the multi-threading, multi-processing enthusiasts out there, notice that I have a bunch of imports. There's no import of threading. There's no import of multi-processing. There are no locks. Everything happens on the main thread, as far as you can see. And so it really is idiot-proof multi-processing. Um, and here's what a traits application looks like a little bit. So here's my, all right, here's the pi iterations. This is nothing to do with traits, nothing to do with traits UI. This is just the core computation. So what are we doing? Create some samples, count how many are inside, dot, 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 yield a new approximation to pi along with those error bars. Um, and then here's my view class. So the view and the plot. And this is traits. This is what traits looks like. So. Uh, a bunch of declarations here, uh, declarative programming. And there's really not very much there. Um, and if you look at the lines of code that actually do anything, there's almost nothing there. It's a bunch of declarations, almost no real code. And you have things like this. OK, so the future is the background task. And it says, whenever you get a result from the future, append that to your results, update the plots. So very, very simple. Um, and then at the end, we have. Uh, some information about exactly how the UI is laid out, and that's almost the biggest bit of the whole, the whole code. And that's it, less than 200 lines of code. Um, OK, so let me wind that up. Uh, so that's traits futures. Just a couple more. OK, so of course, not everything we do is open source. We make a huge use of that end thought, open, uh, sorry, of the open source stack, right? Those 160 libraries just for one project. Um, we do have some secret source. So some details there. I'm not going to go through the details, but of course we have some things that let us talk to the cloud, um, that give us a, a base application to start with, that, that provide our own developers with a, with a place to start. And lastly, I want to come back to that one sentence that I keep repeating. So we've been delivering scientific applications to customers for 17 years, and this touches again on what Eric said, that we're delivering. When I look back at my last nine years, eight years at Enthought, an awful lot of that was better, so slowly, slow improvements of deployment. Deployment is a really, really hard problem to solve. And so I'm not going to talk about that. But if you do want to know more about how we're currently, so we have successive approximations to good deployment, uh, please do go to my colleague Diedrich Pinder's talk later on today. I think it's in the other room, room B. Um, and he's going to go into our current state-of-the-art solution for deployment. Um, okay, so that is 
all I wanted to say. Any questions? I think maybe we have time for a short, one short question. All right, well, thank you very much for, for listening. Okay.